What's going on, sports card hobby family? It's another day. It is another sports card video. Yay! We got a really good one today. We've got a collector series video. DPZ sits down with Filmington. And I got to give Phil a lot of credit. And I give him a lot of hell sometimes, kind of privately. We joke back and forth. But Phil knows his baseball, man. And this was a really great conversation just about the baseball card market, what we saw over the last few years, prospecting versus future Hall of Famers or Hall of Famers vintage type stuff sealed product, what goes into strategy around buying, selling sealed product. And Phil is really deep into all of this stuff and he can speak to it. So enjoy this conversation. Before Frank flips it over to DPZ and Filmington, big thanks to today's video sponsor, What Not. You might be thinking, man, I wish I could get card show level cards from the comfort of my own couch. Well, you can. Check out Whatnot, download the app. They have this really cool special as well, this national special. If you happen to be going to the national, check out their booth there. They have a fun program where they are selling items for $23, $23. One of those items happens to be a Mercedes that Michael Jordan owned in the 90s. So in other words, these are huge sports card and sports memorabilia style items for $23. The opportunity to buy for $23. So check out the WhatNot app to get yourself a chance to buy these items at 23 bucks. All right, Frank, do your thing. Now, now. can't do this anymore all right all right welcome welcome everybody this is the collector series i am dpz and with me i have filmington phil how you doing doing pretty good thanks for having me on i'm excited for this conversation yeah it looks like you have a card shop behind you i was going to say that earlier when we were talking like you you've got like i think all kinds of wax back we have a question we're going to ask you later on in the show and it's you're, you're going to have to answer it, but you, you it seems like you got a you got quite a bit back there. I, I can see it, see it clearly, but yeah, no, great to have you on. I've been looking forward to getting you on this uh, this show and talk to you and get to know you um, for a while now. So I'm very very excited to have you here, and thanks for taking the time. No problem. All right. So first thing, I think everybody wants to know. I'm not sure if you've ever done this on one of your shows. A lot of your shows are pretty focused. So, um, but I think most folks would want to know where the hell did you come from? What happened? I mean, where's, when, when did Phil start collecting cards? What got him into cards? What grew your interest in cards? Did you get back in right before the pandemic? Like what's, what's been your, your, you know, your journey, so to speak with collecting? Yeah. So um, like a lot of people, so right now I'm 38 years old, turning 39 soon. And I collected in the nineties. Um, I was obsessed, you know, I had binders and I had all the players organized by team to the point where I can still memorize. Well, I think at the time there were either 26 or 28 baseball teams where I could literally memorize them in alphabetical order. And I still think I have that order, except that I have to like swap out the expos with, you know, the nationals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, like a lot of people, I gave it up in high school, college for the most part, gave it up. And then I kind of came back. Really, um, in, in 2014 is when I started to speculate. Uh, that's what we used to kind of call it. We didn't call it investing back then. And I know a lot of people are getting away from that language now, uh, given the market we're in, and it completely makes sense to do so. Um, but at that point, you know, I was doing a lot of fantasy baseball, um, and I still am. And personally, I was like, how can I get more direct exposure into these certain players? Because even though I might draft one of the best teams that might not translate to me winning much money um, or any money at all, you know, and, and, and valuing your time and everything throughout a fantasy baseball season. I mean, most of the buy-ins, you know, you're not going to be in too many leagues. Usually that are like a thousand dollars and up. And even if you are, you know, there's still a lot of a lot of time that's required to manage that. So I was like, you know, let me buy some of these players in 2014, 2015 is when I discovered blowout forums, which was helping me kind of, learn from my mistakes um, and my mistakes helped me learn from my mistakes as well. You know, buying the wrong players, pitchers, the wrong brands, the wrong grading companies. Um, at the time, BGS 9.5 was a very strong grade for Bowman Chrome. That of course has changed a bit over the last few years um, for better, for worse. But, you know, so from 2014 through 2018, I was buying select players. Alex Bregman was one of the guys I PC'd. Uh, 
before I started my YouTube channel, which was in, I think like October, 2018. And that's what made it really sticky for me. And that's when I discovered, oh, there's an Instagram for cards. Like people actually do this. Oh, it's bigger than YouTube. Yeah. Um, I, I saw a lot of people when I first started watching YouTube videos, which is like a probably a month before I made my own channel, uh, Jab's family, you know, like him or not, he's drawn a lot of people into the hobby. Um, baseball collector, Mike O, uh, some of the channels that I first stumbled across, Alico 3. And I was like, this is really cool. It seems like there's a tight-knit community. I'm noticing a lot of the same people, creators commenting on other people's videos. Like, And I started to comment on people's videos. I entered into a Silver Jackify giveaway, uh, and I ended up getting two questions right to the point where he was like, all right, uh, Phil McDin, you can't do this anymore. And I was like, hey, I have a channel. And I think he, he didn't believe me at the time. I had like 50 subscribers at the time. <laughs> But um, yeah, and, and it, I mean, the social media thing, the YouTube thing, showing off your cards, um, eventually people kind of encouraged me to do more of the speculation type videos. They tended to be semi more um, watched in, in, in popular videos. And that's where I focus more on like market commentary and things like that. Um, so in 2019, towards the end of that year, and this was like a few months after Jeff Sports Card Investor made his own sort of, you know, buy, sell, hold type videos. I started to do my own series. Uh, and I did that for, I think, four or five episodes. Last one was probably like December 2019. And I decided like, you know, I'm giving people the easy answers. I want to help them in more ways than just giving them interesting players. And I'm disclosing my allocations. And I'm clearly saying like, you know, these are the ways it could go wrong. I had a disclaimer at each of those videos at the beginning saying like, these are the risks that could cause you to lose all your money. Um, at the very end of the video, I would say how much like of my uh, total collection was invested in those players. And it was almost always under 2%, usually under 1% for each of those players. And um, I would focus on non-base cards, cards that I thought had investment potential or speculation potential. And I hoped that people would kind of get more from the videos than the players themselves. So what ended up happening is people just listen to the player suggestions, deviated away from the card suggestions, didn't focus on any of the other commentary that I gave. And I was moving markets. I was giving people the easy answers um, and susceptible to pissing a lot of people off. Like once these cards blew up in their faces, which a lot of them did. Um, for every Luis Arias or Yaron Alvarez, there's a Jack Flaherty or a Walker Bueller or um, Ozzy Alves, right? So yeah. So those videos ended up making my YouTube channel really popular. And I know this isn't exactly what you asked, but I figured I'd give this at the no. intro anyways. Um, and I decided to back away from that a little bit. And when the investment boom, market boom happened in uh, middle of 2020 into 2021, I started to focus more on the buying and selling my, my business motives more than I did the, uh, the channel, the content. Um, and, and part of that kind of makes me feel a little bit happy because I wasn't telling people to buy, buy, buy. I wasn't making much content. Uh, maybe I should have been telling people to sell or to hold or to be careful. Uh, but I think a lot of people were caught up um, in it and didn't know like that the bubble was as close as it was and would be as painful as it was when it popped. So not trying to say that I predicted it because I didn't, but um, clearly there was a lot of just insane optimism, right? unsustainable market prices, crazy card growths, people talking about, well, what's going to happen when Wall Street gets in? It's like, Wall Street's already here. What's going to happen when they get out? Like, you should be asking yourself that. Like, how long, how patient are they going to be? They're not long-term holders of this stuff, like some of this institutional money, right? So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm still here. Um, I've been doing this uh, subscription product for the last four and a half years, and that's been going well. I'm sure we'll talk about the whole wax thing, but sourcing new product has gotten a little bit difficult, but happy to say that I've got over 150. Um, I've got a lot of people that subscribe in multiple different products at once, but I send out over 250 of these things a month and um, I've got really high retention rates. People seem to really like the product, what I'm doing. Uh, they see value in me curating a lineup of packs, not just me throwing together a bunch of stuff that I have in excess of in the, you know, the, in the storage unit. That's not the case. I'm trying to focus on relevant players. I'm trying to focus on products that retain value. Um, and I'm trying to focus on a, a variety of different years and brands and, and be rotating that each month. So something that I've kind of liked 
doing. And when I started doing it in 2019, it wasn't about the margins. It's turned into a profitable business. Started out as more of a passion project. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's a little bit of the background of Filmington. Great, great. So I mean, that, that, is that the rookie explosion box you were talking about there? Is that what you're alluding to? The, the product that you put together and curate? Yeah, yep. Yeah. The RC yeah, explosion I, I, box. I would say, yeah, I, I would, you know, I'm sure it's proprietary. I was going to say, well, what are these products that you feel like have sustainability and are long term, you know, lasting uh, value? But th that's proprietary. You got to keep that to yourself because that's what's, that's your product. That's your, that's your, that's what you're doing. But um, I, I mean, that in itself is great because what you're doing is you're actually still teaching people, right? You're not just going here, go out and buy this. You're going to put this together for you, show you what it is allow you to actually become a collector and a curator of your own, you know, or a investor and, and, and figure out how to buy cards. I guess that leads me to my next question. I mean, it sounds like you, you, you prospect slash invest and collect. So what would, what do you say you collect versus what you prospect or is it the same thing? Yeah. So, you know, I, I've been, I've done some collaborations with those back pages. He's got over 50,000. Well, at this point, it's probably over 80,000 posts on blowout forums. And, uh, and he told me that as I was trying to make a case, like, could I be a collector you know, or, or a hybrid collector investor? And he said that because there's not one card in my, whatever, whatever you want to call it, collection, PC, inventory, portfolio, there's not one card that I own that I wouldn't sell. For me, every card is a number. And because of that, he said that then I'm not a collector. So that's his definition. Um, I've gone through, you know, and I think the first car that I ever bought that I considered an investment instead of just like an ins speculation was a uh, Charizard first edition 1999 English base set. So sought after card, one that's gotten hammered from, you know, the card collapse, just like almost everything else. Mm. Uh, but that had different properties where I felt more comfortable, like holding that for five plus years, where a lot of the other stuff, it's like, especially nowadays. So a lot of it, some of it is my evolution. Some of it's just like the market and how that's evolved, right? Like everything, like the card market, the economic environment right now, you know, um, you know, this, you're a banker, like four to 5% interest rates on savings accounts. Like, should I do that? Or should I buy Mookie bets? Who I've been told is very safe. Yeah. Maybe he's safe. Maybe he won't fall much more. <laughs> the price has been flat over the last year. Right. Even though like right now, I would argue that he's perceived to be closer in accolades and performance and prestige hobby wise to a Bryce Harper or a Arenado or Manny Machado or right. Aaron Judge. He's closer to those guys than he is to a Mike Trout. Will that change? I don't know. What is it going to take to guarantee that his prices go up this year? Maybe that he wins MVP. Maybe number two won't be good enough. I don't know. So I'm, I'm thinking about things like that, where it's like, do I want to buy this Mookie Betts card? You know, may, maybe Pat Mahomes would be the only exception for like a athlete right now that I would buy and feel comfortable holding for a little bit. This is my personal opinion of like right. current values. Um, and th there could be a thesis there, but I'm not a football guy, so don't listen to that. But baseball wise, it's been tough lately. It's been, I, I was telling somebody recently, like this national is going to be interesting. It's going to be a a room filled with 50,000 arbitragers. Like we've turned into these expert, like, what are you buying? Well, I'm just looking for deals, right? Well, if you're buying from somebody else that also is looking for deals, like in yeah. the people that have stuck around, I would say the average intelligence level or knowledge of sports cards has gone up. The people that have withstood the, you know, the card bubble and are still around a few years later, um, people that have been going to card shows so many of those these days the people that are willing to spend you know a thousand bucks to travel halfway across the country to go to chicago for these trade nights for the show it's going to be interesting you know like <laughs> everybody's everybody's like a businessman everybody's in it for themselves like you can see it from the facebook groups like people aren't posting hey i'm looking for this player let me know what you have like maybe you'll see it like here and there with like otani but it's not the same as it was before you don't see as many collectors willing to play, pay market value and you can't blame them. Um, maybe with baseball, you see a little bit more of that, but I don't know. It's just, a, it's a different market. It's still fun. There's still people that are active. Um, it probably helps that cards are addictive, right? Like that's true. This, this isn't like a fidelity account where, okay, like time for a new opportunity. I'm just going to liquidate all my cash. 
first of all, cars aren't as liquid. Second of all, like you got a little bit of an emotional attachment. Like, yeah, with Juan Soto, maybe you wait till next year till he has that, you know, the, 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 maybe he'll have a strong second half next year, like he usually does. Uh, it's not the right timing for this guy. Or, ah, I really like that gold refractor. I really like the way the auto pops at this card. Um, I think that kind of helps kind of keep people in for sure. Um, well, I think it's, I think it's yeah. interesting though, when you say, you know, you're not a collector because you're willing to sell everything, every, every, every card has a price. Well, I'll say this. I mean, I think all of us are collectors yeah. until we can't afford to be collectors until we have to sell the card. And so we need to move the card. And I think a lot of us move cards we never thought we'd move. And I, I like to ask that question because I think, you know, most collectors dear to their heart, they, they really want to keep all the cards they have. They, they, they matter, you know, the, the cards matter. And I think that's important. And for me, it is very important, but I've moved some cards. I never thought I'd move. I mean, maybe it's because my taste changed. Maybe it's because I'm becoming more focused. Maybe I'm coloring up to a better card. Uh, maybe that 8.5 just doesn't cut it anymore. I need to find a nine because I just can't stand the 0.5. Uh, maybe it's a BGS 9.5 that I just need it to be a 10 because I just have this nuance with 10s. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why cards you think you're never going to sell or you're going to move. And sometimes you just need the cash, man. You know, sometimes things just happen. So collectors can have all different types of reasons for wanting to do that. And I don't think there's anything wrong um, with purely being in an investment vehicle for you and having fun with it, almost like fantasy baseball, right? It, it sounds like when we started fantasy, this was sort of an extension to fantasy baseball for you, but it was more tangible. You can hold on to the, you can hold on to the card versus just, you know, is that, does that, is that fair to say? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, so I still pay attention to the artwork. I still appreciate nice designs. I still have emotional connections to some of these players and cards. And you could argue that that's enough to make me a collector. The fact that I have some amount so. of emotional attachment to the, yeah, you know, to the card. Um, in addition to the player itself. So so with me, and I kind of glossed over this, but Juan Soto would be my guy. Um, I am selling a few of his cards right now, depending on where this gets, when this gets uploaded, they might've already sold. So mm -hmm. there's a few key cards or smaller cards um, that I am selling and some key cards that I'm holding. So I, I still consider him to be my primary PC. If you were to ask me that, somebody on the street, hey, what's your PC? You don't want to hear all the, you know, the context. Yeah, Juan Soto, he's my guy. But, you know, he's starting to frustrate me a little bit, uh, like he is with a lot of people. So I'm in a Juan Soto Instagram chat. And it's just like, people are just like, <laughs> there was so much blind optimism in there uh, throughout the boom. People predicting card prices. Oh, the first Bowman Chrome autograph is going to be 12K. And I'm just like, stop. I'm like, first of all, like his cards already peaked in January. They're not going to go up higher before the season started. Like he already got like a 30% run up. Do you understand how this works? The next person that gets a 30% run up won't be him. It'll be somebody else that hasn't gotten it yet, if they even get it at all. Because, you know, as we talked before the show, in any sport, often it's like four or five guys that'll get like, you know, serious market movement in the upward direction in like the first half of the year, right? It, it's not usual that, and I guess with, with seasonality, it's a little different where you might see like a small bump across the board for baseball modern players anticipation of the season we've seen right. that in the past and that's that's gotten more muted over time as people have understood those cycles but yeah um th this instagram chat it, it was just <laughs> i know there's probably people watching it but it, it, it's like so hard for me not to be negative because we're okay his ops went up a point today like we don't care yes he walked three times today we don't care like we're not buying the next coming of joey Votto. this is a guy that had player comps at one point of Ken Griffey Jr., Barry Bonds, Ted Williams, <laughs> um, to, to sustain those current prices. I don't need to tell you this, but it's like he's just – he needs to do a little bit more than what he's doing now. And it's interesting. When you say that, that's something that clicked with me. When I was – I had a bunch – I had a I had Juan Soto. I had – I mean, I had, I had pretty much everybody. I know we talked before the show as well about how, you know, I, I was pretty – I still kind of am a little bit jaded. I'm still getting through it. Um, yeah, I was a little pissed off. I was a little frustrated. I felt kind of duped, but I never, I'm not blaming anybody. You know, I own it. It's fine. I'm, I'm accountable. No one forced me to do anything. I've learned through it. And actually I'm still as, as, in, as excited about the hobby as I ever was, ever have been. And I'm, I'm going to continue to be a, hopefully a fruit, a engaged member of the hobby. I do think that, it did teach you teach me to go. Okay, so we're we're hoping that this player is going to be Ken Griffey Jr. Well, that that was the reason why I even got back in. Is he's like my sports hero. 
grew up with them. I'm here in Seattle. So it was, it was just obvious. So I'm like, why don't I just PC my favorite player ever? Why don't I just PC the guy we're all trying to pair these guys to? It's fun to have yeah. a little skin in the game. Okay. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I've got a couple J rods, right? I, 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 I had a first Bowman Chrome Mike Trout for a while. And I just, I kind of felt like this guy's going to get hurt for the rest of his career. And I feel like I might be able to come back and get this card later and it's still, it maybe even be cheaper. So I, I moved that into really good Griffey and I, I continue to do that. I've done that. Um, I've even moved some Griffey to get better Griffey. And I just kind of felt like if I'm going to hang on to anything, if I'm going to be holding any bag, I want it to be a player that I feel like transcends not just the hobby and the sport, has that appeal. Like Mickey Mantle has that appeal. Babe Ruth, you know, the, the card itself. Mike Trout to a degree too, right? You got that the, 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 upstate, the update card and all its variations. Th these are cards that sort of like speak to the hobby. They're, they are foundational bedrock cards. And the player itself is is a, has its own demographic of fan base and collector base that's just very deep and rich. It goes, you know, it may not be as big as Michael Jordan say, right? But it runs as deep. I mean, the waters is deep. The lake may not be as big, but the it, the depth of the lake is the same. So I like the depth of that collector base. That made me feel comfortable, you know, spending a bit more money on a on a on one said card. So. With that in mind, is that, I mean, we just kind of, you know, I had a question on here for card investments versus hobby. And I, you really just answered that. Between the two of us, we kind of answered that. Where do you see this going for you and for the, the hobby as a whole? Fanatics is here with Fanatics Live. You've got them putting together shows that, that they're going to bring, you know, all this stuff to the table. They're, they're at stadiums. I was at the All Star game. They have, I mean, Top's presence at the All Star game was, was very, it was there. You you it was you were not mistaken. I mean, it was obvious that Tops had a presence at at the All Star Game. I know they're full on with Fanatics, and they already have the Tops license, so they can kind of go all in on that. But where do you see this hobby going? Yeah, so a lot there, a lot of diverging thoughts. You know, I um, recent news came out about new rules for hobby shops and direct accounts, right? Of, of, of Fanatics. Um, and that, when I read that, I read through the lines and I mean, it was pretty explicit. Like I, my ability to source product for my subscription product. So my ability to source wax is going to get very, very difficult for all new baseball releases. Mm -hmm. um, and starting with 23 Tops Finest, which came out like a few weeks ago. Yeah. I'm on this very common. I won't list it, but a lot of people know what it is. It's a, it's a dealer to dealer. <laughs> Dealers in the name. It's a business to business site. And I noticed there were a hell of a lot of buyers and only like one seller at a time. And because of that, prices were higher for us. Um, now, a lot of people think that Fanatics, because they're cutting out the middlemen, they're completely disrupting distribution. They're cutting out all of the flippers, like I'm a flipper myself, right? That, that take product and then pass it on to somebody else. Some people think that the end consumer will end up paying a lower price. What I would say is maybe, maybe not. We don't know what the effect will be on a, you know, a pure monopoly um, from a manufacturer standpoint, especially when they take over those other sports, um, which you already had kind of some of that with tops anyways, but they want more of the pie, but that doesn't mean that they also won't increase factory cost in charge, you know, the direct accounts more too. And, and consumer a little bit more as well. You know, like Tops probably sees what, uh, well, Fanatics. Fanatics probably has seen what Panini is doing in their flagship product, mm -hmm. like their equivalent to Tops Chrome, maybe even flagship, but probably Tops Chrome is like Panini Prism, Donruss Optic. And these, I mean, these hobby boxes sell for much more than what people consider an overpriced Tops Chrome baseball box. So whether that's Panini's doing, whether that's the market being stupid or some other factor, um, or blaming on distributors inclusion in the past. I, I don't know. But what I've seen based on Top's Finest, that not just my price, but the end buyer of Top's Finest, I always have a target price heading into every release. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've talked about this in some of my videos, but like, how much should I pay for a 22 Finest that released last year? What is 22 Finest going for now? 
What do they do with the product? How do they change it? How is the checklist different? How is the autograph subjects different? Um, I look in all the variables. What's quality control like? Um, you won't know that till after the product comes out. You know, redemptions, things like that, special other hit cards. There could be differences. There could be some new configurations. Maybe it's going to retail now. I've got to factor that in. So my target price for 23 Tops Finest was 170 bucks. Um, 175 maybe was like on the higher side. I ended up paying like 205. Uh, and usually I pay like 10 to 15% less than the end customer. So that would mean that like a market, good market value for them, like good secondary market price for them would be like 200 bucks, but people are paying like 235, 240 for this product. So because it's that far off, you know, I build in some, some of a buffer where I could be wrong in my calculation, but it seems like from that one product that end consumer won't be paying less than they were before. Even in a world where all of these greedy middlemen and colluders like ruin things for them. Um, so there's that. But if I'm going to re remove myself from the equation, really answer your question and like what's going to happen or things going to get better with fanatics, I'm going to say it's a net positive, although I hate to admit it. Um, it's going to be better than what we had in the past. Jeff Wilson talked about a lot of the positives on one of his recent videos. I think it was like the Jeff Wilson show or his second handle. Um, and sports card radio guys have talked about it too. And they bring up a lot of good points. Um, fanatics has a lot of power. They've got a very strong brand. They've got a lot of penetration. The, the fact that leagues are aligned with them from a profit sharing perspective, there's a lot of things that could go well, just to make some might take some time for this roadmap to play out And maybe in 10 years or five years, they don't 10 X the hobby, but they could 2x 3x the hobby based on metrics um that might not be card values going up that much it could be the number of participants it could be the amount of money that's being spent per person that might not correlate 100 percent to card values because there's other factors like supply in there supply graded cards just new releases coming out even if print runs were to stay constant there's going to be more supply coming in so i think that's what a lot of people don't understand and when they say like oh the hobby's in bad shape the hobby's dead it's like actually if you were looking at the number of participants maybe we've seen like a 10 to 30 percent drop since 2020 i'm just throwing numbers out there mm -hmm. maybe some prices have gone down you know i, I know some have gone down 96 98 but on average you know 60 percent drop you know it's different when you have to look at different segments vintage versus modern versus different sports non-sports etc um I think it's possible to have super busy card shows and just as many active participants, but average spend per customer goes down and prices fall. And a lot of that's because of supply. And I think you've talked about this in some of your videos, but like, you know, just every day, X amount of cards being released into the population. You look at eBay last comp or whatever alt or card ladder and okay, there's like that much more value of cards out there to support. So it's like this constant pricing pressure that's like weighing down all the existing cards just for people to stomach all the new cards in circulation. It's tough, um, especially if you were to look at it like year to year versus day to day um, and factoring in increased print runs, increased products, things like that um, with demand falling. It, it, it's tough, but but the the falling market prices and the panic from that standpoint, people losing their shirts, that doesn't tell the, the full picture. Um, the full story at all. Uh, and, and it's going to take a while for this narrative to, to play out, I think. But I think it's probably going to be a good thing. Will my subscription product go out of business at some point because I can't source new product? Maybe. But will the, health, will the, will the hobby be healthier and stronger? And will cards be setting all-time highs at some point in the future, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, five years down the line? Yeah, that's all. that's all definitely on the table, I think. Yeah, I think it's on the table. I wonder too, though. You have a flood of product, you know, so you call junk slab era. You've got all this product out there, even if the next five years is over overprinted, and you see a decline in interest, and you know, fanatics has to adjust and, and pivot. I I wonder if the if that just makes and this is I'm borrowing from. I always like to give credit where credits due um, and source stuff the proper way. Josh Crodberg Chronicles mentioned on one of his one of his lives that you know they asked a question about parallels 
And there's just so many new parallels. There's tons of parallels. And it just waters down the whole product and makes it more difficult for people to appreciate the true great, you know, the golds or the one of ones or the blues or whatever it may be, all the true colors, right? True para, true refractors and true colors. And he goes, well, no, I don't look at it that way. I look at it like it just makes those cards look that much better if there's more parallels that people have to now seek. And if there's an interest and a drive for like the lunar blue, okay, the, the balooner, if, if someone's looking for that card, well, it sure the hell makes the blue look a lot better, right? It's a, it's a better card now. Um, the gold just looks that much better, that that red refractor, the yellow refractor, if we're talking baseball, right? I'll, I'll keep it to baseball because I love and own that. That's pretty much all I know is baseball. So if we talk about the true colors, it makes the red that much more special when there's like 50 other parallels that are introduced into the product. Whether people have them, want them or not, that just makes that that particular parallel that much more sought after because it's recognized, you know, from a tribal standpoint and from a historical standpoint in the hobby as the parallel you want to have of X player. I mean, do you do you subscribe to that thought, or do you think that just having too many parallels and too, the print runs being too high just brings everything down like a tide? Yeah, I'd say, I'd say um, there's a little bit of a little bit of both are true. So if you were to look at like, um, so I create like multipliers um, for Bowman Chrome autographs. A couple, I try to do it every couple of years. Yep. I've done two of these charts so far, and if you're to track some of like the true higher end colors, like the red, the orange, gold, um, they've done pretty well against the base over time, and in some cases they've gone up because they're printing more and more base. So people have realized that, and so they're they're choosing the colors over the base. In some cases, you get a, a higher multiplier, like the instead of the red selling for forty x the base, it might sell sell for like sixty to eighty x, and that all depends on the player, as well. So you you see these these true colors, like the a true gold um, might do like ten x the base, um, maybe a little bit more nowadays for like products twenty twenty one and up, because again, overprinting the base autographs a little bit. And that all varies in the same set by player. They'll short print certain guys. It's hard to track down how many base autographs there are of each. Um, but one can kind of assume that between Trout's 09 Bowman draft picks and prospects product that came out and Juan Soto in 2016, you saw a jump from like, I don't know, 1200 to 1500 in 09 to like 2300 in, in 2016. This is one product, one player. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain guys that are short printed. And now you're getting like 3,500 plus with certain players, I believe, in most of the major Bowman releases, um, at least 3,000 with a lot of players. So not a jump like what Panini showed us with some of their parallels, but it, it definitely is quite a big jump over the course of 10 years or so. Um, but um, so, so the golds and oranges, they're outperforming the shimmers, the green grass uh, counterparts. Like a, a true green is going to sell for more than a green grass. It's still going to sell for roughly the same ratio as it did a few years ago. Um, but sometimes if you look back at players like Mookie Betts that doesn't have a whole lot of autographs um, and other guys at Juan Soto, he doesn't really have too many shimmery or wave type of uh, Bowman Chrome autographs. Sometimes you see their stuff being a little bit more coveted. Uh, and, and you as a buyer or a seller having a little more leverage to sell those cards when there's just less competition. Mm -hmm. So I think yes and no. I don't think like people are going to widely boycott, you know, the uh, the non-true stuff. I still think it's going to sell for a premium um, and maybe it'll sell for 50% of the, the true color, like tends to be the case with like gold shimmer versus true gold. Mm -hmm. It's not going to sell for nothing. It's still going to sell for quite a bit more than the base. Uh, but um, maybe all of those cards are kind of weighed down. All of the colors, the trues, the manufactured scarcity can try parallels. Maybe they're all kind of held down. It's just hard to see it because they're anchored off a of base auto, which is also held down. So it seems like it's not hurting the, the higher end colors, if that makes sense. But if you're going to pair it from the two to a player, like, five six years ago that has a significantly less amount of cards and autographs than um maybe then you'd see it okay well let me let me segue from that then to this question um i'm gonna i'm gonna dance around i'm gonna go back to wax holding in a minute here but i want to ask you this question since we're on it let's switch to tops chrome let's go to 2022 tops chrome let's talk about julio rodriguez's rookie card there's i mean scotty b cards had a great episode where he detailed i mean he's got 
tons of tremendous value in his videos and he details the numbers the pack odds the pull odds all that stuff um and, and it, it actually helped me in discerning which you know julio to get because there's the sp psa 10 and then there was the logo fractor psa 10 and i opted for the logo fractor psa 10 so i'm going to be very clear that's the card i own that's the card i have and that's this mm -hmm. question sort of uh selfishly for myself and maybe from other folks out there the tops chrome community um on tops chrome had the gaff the hobby box lights all of a sudden had those packs and you know the those the silver packs we didn't we didn't get we all thought we we're going to get this this these these wanders and or that wanders but the, the julio's in them didn't get it what in your mind is, is a logo fracture was introduced is that is that a set do you think that's going to have carry value over time it obviously there's less of them like there's 300 of them we think that pop has not grown the sp pop has grown so i'm just looking at the psa 10 for julio that felt like the better decision the values have held up better than the sp chrome tops chrome julio do you feel like logo fractor inaugural set do you think that's a set that's going to have some staying power is that going to be important assuming julio is who we think he's going to be yeah, I'd say it's it's too early to tell. You know, with with Topps Chrome Sapphire, which a lot of people try to compare it to, um, it, it took a little bit for that set to really take off. Probably a year and a half after 2018, and that was the third year the product had come out. And it was a great combination of like, you know, they didn't print too many and or too much of the product, ten thousand boxes, something like that. Okay. Um, the the format was really sweet. Obviously, the players, the photography of Acuna. You had the on card um, autograph of. Otani short printed. Um, so with logo fractor, it, it's a little dangerous. So one of the things that I've recognized is in a downtrending market, I had rotated a lot of my, you know, inventory from singles into wax thinking that, oh, well, you know, finite amount of this product, um, physical assets, you know, usually tend to do well in inflationary times. Well, you know, baseball card wax products that are less than five years old, especially, they're going to be highly correlated to the cards within it. So Correct. the J-Rod card, prime target for manipulation, um, it jumped, it like doubled randomly in like January, I think. The other four base Logo Fractor SPs did not, they reacted a little bit, but guess what? I just sold a Bobby Witt PSA 9 for like under $200. And you know, at one point, you know, J-Rod was only outselling Witt like, two to one or two and a half to one. And I don't know, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. If anything, I think that logo fractor wax and I own a bunch of it, um, mm -hmm. blowouts paying 180 for it. I've already sold a few at 180. I might try to include some for my subscription product customers. Uh, it was a fun product to open. We're also, I mean, again, like it took top scrum Sapphire, like multiple years for it to take off, right? Year and a half after 2018, which again was the third year the product was released. Uh, or a year, at least a year after 2018 when it came out. Um, we're going to have to see what they do to it this year. How much of the logo fractor are they going to print? You know, is there going to be like some sort of, um, you know, all stars aligning type situation with like, it doesn't look like it's going to be this year. <laughs> but look, I mean, Corbin Carroll, I mean, he's holding his own. L.A. De La Cruz isn't going to be featured till next year. So, yeah. Well, there's also competition from Cosmic and Gilded. I mean, not Gilded as much. That was more of like a, probably more of a short-term fad. And a lot of people got completely destroyed when they opened that product, which didn't help. Um, yeah. With Logo Fractor, people forget, but that was available for like 50 to 60 bucks. A lot of people opened it at that price. Um, how many people are opening it at 120? Is it attractive? Is it fun? Is it fun to hold at that price? Clearly, but at 180 to 210, I don't know. Maybe it's just doing well because a lot of it's been open because a lot of people got in at low price points. And that was when a lot of people were speculating on all the guys from 2022. And most of those guys have fallen on their faces. I would like to believe in it, but I mean, I, I, if I'm, I, I'm not holding wax long-term, I'm not buying into it at, at 200. I'll just say that. Yeah. Right. Right. You need to see more of a track record before you feel comfortable holding on to a product, a, a product having value long term a player though that's always the question i have well, let's pretend it doesn't last long or maybe they overprint it in the future but they didn't in 2022 does that matter does that matter to that player does it matter to that car long term sorry say that again <laughs> okay and this is obviously a very selfish question so i'm basically pointing this at myself maybe there's some people out there that have a wit 10 and or they have uh, a julio as well 
say the product just fizzles out. You know, like yeah. say it's a kind of a gilded type product where people go, like, yeah, or they start overprinting the daylights out of it and it becomes just another product that people go, okay, and yawn. Or they don't really want to buy it or they get killed by it opening it. Um, and they just, the car doesn't carry the kind of, the, the, the potential, the, the brand doesn't carry, you know, any, any weight in the future. Does the card itself, say the Julio card, does that card still carry value because it was such a short printed version during mm -hmm. his rookie year, or is that just going to be another uh, random car, rookie card that he had that year? Well, you know, it's a really nice looking card. Um, but the Top Chrome SP, a lot of people like that one too. Yeah. Um, you think that, be, that's, I mean, that's issue, a better question. Does that surpass the, the, the issue? Uh, I'm trying to think back at like, I'm trying to think back at like the gem rate and the uh, the population of both of those cards. No, I mean the, the logo fractor was printed two fifty ish, something yeah. like that for the SPs, and I think Top Scrum SP was like, and not all those redemption packs were open right away. Like I'm still holding a bunch for my customers. I still have Top Scrum hobby boxes. Um, yeah. that, that's it. Looks like that's exceeding uh, print run estimates of like a thousand or more. So I, I don't think that ever becomes the case, but. The issue is more too many rookies, too many competing rookie cards. Right. Um, when you factor in like Topps Chrome update parallels, That's like right. I have the Topps update black. Like yeah. I usually, like I have a Soto black too. I don't feel, it doesn't feel as special holding that Julio black, knowing that he was in a flagship product already, but also because he's, he's got a lot of cards, a lot of parallels. And it was sometimes where I get a little squeamish is when there's not a, like a clear hierarchy of cards. And that's one of the reasons why Bowman Chrome autograph is great. And baseball is a little bit easier to understand, at least from the perspective of the hierarchy is, you know, that that's probably the grail card and you just got to target the true colors and, you know, autograph, make sure the autograph's clean, make sure there's a, a, a one on it first Bowman. Um, and that's usually the card to have. Is it always going to be that way? Uh, Is at some point that. Topps Dynasty going to surpass it? Maybe, but I mean, usually things uh, ah, stay the same. Oh, froze. Uh, I froze. Am I there? There you are. You came back. All right. No big deal. You froze a little bit. You said you were saying make sure it has a clean autograph and there's a one on the car, the first Bowman, obviously. that It is much easier to navigate the landscape there because it's – it's, you know, no matter how many parallels they come up with in time, we know the true colors, the first Bowman, even like a gold refractor, first Bowman, even with that auto, something you can target. It's a little clearer, right? Tops is just out of hand. They're just out of pocket now. It's like, what's that mean for the Tops community that just wants to collect, like the Scotty B's of the world that loves the Tops rookie card? I, it's got to be frustrating when you're trying to collect player in the flag. I mean, you look at the flagship. It, I mean, what do you what do you get? I mean, it's impossible to collect. I don't know. That, that that would be frustrating for me as a collector, or even an investor. To find the card that's actually going to carry the value. If you wanted to hold it for like a five year window or two year window, what card's going to be the card? Uh, that would be my frustration. So I'll move into this question: wax holding. You had a great episode talking about wax. I mean, we only have a couple more questions here, so you can you can elaborate as much as you'd like here. You, you mentioned, you talked about wax a little bit. What was your thought? What's your big thought? If, if, if I'm someone going, hey, Phil, I want to buy wax and hold wax. How do I, what's my, what should my strategy be? Let's talk about baseball because we both know baseball. What should my strategy be for holding wax? Yeah, well, the first thing you probably want to do is understand risk factors, like with any investment. So how could this go wrong? You know, um, what? Okay, so if you have experience with single cards and you kind of know how they work, you understand risk factors, you know kind of what's worked for you, yeah. and you want to apply some of what you learned to wax. So the wax, there's going to be a, a storage cost associated with it if you have cases and cases. Like I have a storage unit that costs money. You've got to make sure that the boxes are off the ground too. You've got to worry about um, risk with theft and, and water and fire damage too. So in addition to that, You've got um, some of the same issues with market swings, which could be lagged, whether singles go up and down. Often there's arbitrage type people. I'm one of them on eBay that tries to take advantage of those moves if they don't correct fast enough. 
And sometimes those blow up in your face if the player doesn't continue to sustain that performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so some of the same risks with regular cards. Uh, one of the, I mean, a few reasons why I like it is because you don't have as much content, subject matter expertise, people that share tips and tricks for how to collect and flip. And you don't get much of that. Uh, maybe you would have from like a retail perspective, if you joined one of those discords and you had one of those bots at the time, but we're in a different world now. And that's not really what I ever really did anyways. Um, so knowing that there's not a whole lot of experts out there that are doing this. Um, now there are big businesses like blowout cards that are holding some of the good stuff. They're certainly holding some of that back. There's actually a fund that's associated with blowout cards that has a few million dollars in high end releases, right? They're not going to wow. pick the junky stuff. It's going to be hobby product, right? So, <clears throat> um, you know, and another benefit with wax is you um you don't have to worry about manipulation as much there are there are there is going to be some shill bidding but not as much as you'll hear from like oh mahomes silver prism you're dealing with kind of a different demographic a different type of buyer um and maybe wax is just a little bit harder to manipulate unless you're talking about like near release with a lot of hobby shops kind of colluding on, on price setting um so you don't have to worry about that. And another thing is if you're in a room with like nine other people that are doing the same thing and like, oh yeah, let's hold on to this box of wax. Or let's just say you're in a room with nine other guys in the hobby, randomly selected, and you all buy the, the same hobby box of whatever is hot from your LCS. There's a really high probability that eight to nine of those people out of 10 won't be able to keep that sealed for a period of a year or longer. You know, they're not gonna have that willpower. Yeah. So what does that do? That helps you because that means more products opened and less is sealed, which makes the product in theory go up because it's harder to find, right? Just from a supply demand perspective, just looking at that one variable. So with products, I mean, you've got to understand what you're buying into. You've got to understand the history. Some of the things I talked about earlier with like, okay, um, what are some of the premium brands for the sport? what is their performance history over the last few years what is the difference between this product and you've got to look at not just last year's release and what it's selling for now but also what was it selling at close to release because you'll for a lot of products 90 percent, you'll see the product come down 30 to 60 days after release once breakers don't have a need for it hobby shops are trying to get rid of it and not a lot of collectors are opening that stuff anymore and they're focusing on the new thing. So wax, unless it's something where the manufacturers underestimated demand or just didn't print enough, or maybe the product ended up being better or more fun to rip than was expected. Usually the price will come down on wax. Um, so you've got to understand like when you're looking at last year's prices, like you've got to be comparing it. You got to know what you're comparing it to, like the timing of that, that price being used. Um, so understanding the print run jump, Blowout forums, if you're not great at math, if you don't have the, the pack odds in front of you, um, they can be pretty good at providing that information. Now, Fanatics releases um, information about pack odds in advance, which I think is actually really cool. And I think a lot of people didn't expect that. Yeah. So understanding how the configurations change, understanding the SKUs that have been added. Um, I hate to like make general statements, but Bowman Draft has been a much better product to buy and hold long term over the last few years than Topps Chrome really? has. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the Holy Grail card being in Bowman. A lot of that has to do with Topps slash Fanatics doing a better job preserving the strength of that brand and that product. Minimal print run increases closer to 15 to 20 percent, not increasing autograph subjects by a factor of like 1.7x or 2x. And oh, veterans are going to be included now, too. Um, and maybe this is all strategic. You know, maybe they just want to make a product like Topps Chrome more available. Bowman Draft is going to be hobby only. Mm -hmm. But you've got to understand that. You've got to understand the legacy. You've got to really be an expert of the products. Um, another thing that can benefit you if you're buying into Bowman is that it's confusing to a lot of people. There's three major Bowman releases each year. Bowman Baseball, Bowman Chrome, Bowman Draft. If you asked 10 people that hold a Bowman, uh, a Juan Soto 2016, 
Bowman Chrome first autograph, you ask them which product from 2016 did that come out of, I bet five would get it wrong and wouldn't understand that it came from Bowman Chrome. So you've got people that don't even understand the checklists, you know, and, and that can help you. You've got people that don't understand the, the redemptions um, and, and which ones are expired and which ones aren't, which can help you from an arbitrage perspective. And the fact that, <laughs> hate to say it, but collectors or people buying this stuff to rip, buying it from you years after, you know, they don't understand that from 2018 tops heritage high number that Acuna and Soto are expired redemptions, like the autographs, the blue ink and the red ink, and they don't know that, but they're buying it. I mean, the fact that only 15% of people understand that in the marketplace, that's going to help prices. You know, it's, oh, well, why didn't this fall? Because the redemptions are expired because people don't know these things. Um, so yeah, so hopefully that gives you a little bit with wax, uh, 101 and uh i've got another video on it that if you search through the filmington archives you maybe can find a little bit more i actually have one on like retail investing <laughs> it was a another content creator was talking about like his plan to buy 21 optic football blasters and what got me was like his target price his target appreciation he thought he estimated to be like 100 percent over the course of a year and so I had to break down all the factors for like why that probably wasn't going to work. Right. Um, right. That's another thing. Like you can't assume that what happened in 2016 will happen now, even if the right. product hasn't changed that much, even if 21 optic football blasters are still good. So you're looking at a different pool, a product, uh, a pool of buyers, different type of demand. Um, you're also looking at higher SRP prices for blasters. So like how much of this stuff's gonna be opened? You've got to really be concerned with the velocity of the rip within one year of release. Like how much of this stuff is going to get opened and like, and also who's the end buyer of this? Like, who am I going to sell this to? If you're buying blasters because you think they're cheaper than hobby boxes, well, a breaker is probably not going to want to take those from you a year from now. Um, ultra modern retail is not really hot right now for basketball and football. I don't know if you knew a hobby box. Yeah. You know, certain players in that, Trevor Lawrence, yep, like Fields, like, yeah, okay. They, they could do well and maybe there'll be demand for that hobby box from a breaker, from a shop, from a customer that just wants to open it. Blasters, you know, you've got a smaller demographic and yes, you are selling to people that can't afford the hobby box, but how are you gonna ship those out too? Only nine fit in a medium you know, priority box. Um, right. That could be a pain as well to for, for a little return, right? In a huge there's, a, box. there's a lot of nuance involved. I mean, you have to do your homework. I think this isn't something you just casually do. This is something you study up on. You do your due diligence. You have a focused plan. You figure it out. I mean, you got to think about redemptions, right? I think redemptions are, that's the one thing that always scared me with the issue with redemptions in general, not getting them fulfilled or not getting what you think you're going to get. Expired redemption is a real issue. I mean, you're buying wax with an expired redemption of a card that matters, and that's why you're buying that card. You talk about the high number, uh, Tops Heritage. I mean, those real one autos are pretty awesome. I mean, you get people. There's there's a there's a demographic of collectors that just they love the heritage. That's that's their jam, and that's a that's an issue. I think I mean, wax is just it's tricky. When I, I remember you put that video out, I'm like, man, this is intriguing because I think during the boom in 2020, everybody thought they'd go to Target and just buy these blasters and are going to get rich. Um, I was one of them going there buying a ton of blasters and, and I didn't, I was opening them. I mean, that's how terrible I was. I, I couldn't, I couldn't just keep them and sell them. I sold a couple, but I opened most of them and got just destroyed. But um, <clears throat> the Bowman Chrome thing, I'll, I'll allude back to that. The Bowman Chrome chase prospect, I, I, go, I go back and forth on it, but at the, at, I always end up back with the Bowman Chrome. I started with that. I've always been interested in that. I feel like there's always a new play. This cool because it's kind of a, it keeps, yeah, there's going to be draft classes for football and bat, for football and basketball. I get that. But the Bowman Chrome, there's so many more prospects. There's so many more people that can hit. It's like who thought, what, in 2000, oh, what was it? What year was it? So remember for Tatis's year, Tatis wasn't the guy everybody was going after right. year, right? And so the thought of that being the case where you're going after X player and X player, but this guy, even Trout, we've, we've all seen the video, mm -hmm. the guy passing over the gold. <laughs> all right, I mean, what are we going to do with that? Yeah. Maybe we might sleeve it. We don't know. Like that whole, that's, that's what catches all of us. We just go, that is awesome. Like 
who is Ellie De La Cruz. I got a buddy of mine that does. He, he does it a lot. He was big on Ellie. He got a bunch of Ellie. Ellie's, he's like, he's eating right now. And he's so happy. And I'm like, that is really, really cool. The opportunity to pros prosper on, on, on getting, getting ahead of somebody, getting somebody right. Baseball gives you more of that opportunity. And we talked before the show. There's a lot of money in that. A lot more than people think. People enjoy mm -hmm. the thrill of, of sort of gambling on that product in a sense. So if I'm holding wax, boy, I feel like a lot better holding a Bowman draft or a Bowman chrome from a certain yeah, I mean, yeah, some of these years are they're gonna they're not gonna they're gonna get you killed, but you know, you get the year right. Like think about Ellie De La Cruz's year. I mean, like think about holding some of that product right now. I mean, do you, do you have any of that product? Are you moving some of that product? Do you know? Yeah, so, I made a video in January about uh, the top 2022 products. Yeah. I forget if it was to hold, or I think it might have been like investment related. But 2022 yeah. Bowman Baseball was my number one allocation and number one on the list. I got lucky because Ellie hit. If he didn't, then Hobby Boxes would probably still be at 200 bucks. Correct. Uh, but um, yeah, the the cool thing about Bowman. Now with Bowman Draft, three to four years after the product comes out, maybe you've got a bunch of duds and the product kind of falls below release date pricing. And that's going to be reality for a lot of these. So it's not like, you know, just because it's one of the better premium brands doesn't mean that it it might be a bad investment as well. And we don't know that yet. Like with Jackson Holiday from 2022, looks like a pretty special player. Uh, yeah. But, you know, so did, so did Torkelson, right? Um, a lot of people liked Andrew Vaughn a lot. Um, 2019's helped with Ellie Rushman and Carol and some other guys. So that product will probably be fine. But um, yeah, Bowman Bowman's awesome because unlike some of the other sports, of course, you're getting their grail cards, but they're coming out early mm -hmm. from with baseball. You don't have to wait halfway yeah. through the season or they're you're schedule. getting it years before the players yeah. debut in most cases. And yeah. when you're opening a box, the experience is great. Like you, you, because you don't know what these guys are going to amount to. You can kind of guess if you look at the back and you're like, oh, geez, you know, this guy's like already 30 years old. And he... Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're but, uh, but, but and you've, a high, you've got a higher floor on all those like random hits at release. So it's kind of cool. And I think that's what's held it withstand some of the pressure against the base card destruction. So like flagship, even Topps Chrome to an extent, like really got hammered um, with base cards coming back down to earth after 20 like midway through 2021 really right uh, for baseball i think the peak was a little bit later than basketball i think with baseball was like march 2021 for ultra modern for the most part um and like most of the value from like flagship boxes used to come from psa 10 graded base cards with bowman chrome a little bit of a different story you still had you know high price base cards but the autos um you're more likely to hit parallels of relevant players relevant <laughs> Right after release, within a year or two after release, maybe not relevant in 10 years from now. <laughs> Different story. But yeah, Bowman's really cool. Getting that Holy Grail card, being like that coming out when nothing else is available, really. Um, if you don't count some of the weird off brands and some of the Panini stuff and the Leaf stuff. But, um, and it's a completely different situation for guys that want to speculate in Wemby, right? And, and he's got a weird situation with Bowman University, but. So maybe a bad example, but like a Zion or a T Law or mm -hmm. Mac Jones at one point, <laughs> Bailey Zappi, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think you also there's the barrier of entry is much lower for Bowman. You know, like my buddy, he sell he he had all these Ellies, right? He was he couldn't even list the cards fast enough. The first Bowman, just the first Bowman yeah. playing Chrome. He couldn't list them fast enough. They're they're coming off the the just coming off the rack so fast. He had to keep just raising the price until they slowed down. That's how that, that that was like the desire and the hunger and demand for that guy. And, and so it, it, it teaches you something. You start going, wow, that, that community is very much vibrant and very much alive and engaged in, the, in their product and in the, in, the, in the sport. They're watching baseball. I was at the, like I said, I was at the All-Star game. There were so many young people there. There were so many young people, passionate, excited about baseball. It was something else. I mean, if you don't think if people go oh, baseball, the numbers are going down, football, basketball, forget about it. Go to a baseball game in some mm. of these bigger markets. Yeah, New York, Boston, you're going to be you're going to be fine. Or, you know, St. Louis, Chicago, cut. You're going to be fine. But you know, even these these like mid regional markets like Seattle, San Diego, the you know, San Diego is basically buying everybody right now, and they still can't win. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. But you still, I can't, I can't. I have nothing to say with the Mariners playing like crap, but. You have all these like 
young people showing up and and excited and and just really into it. And there's a there's a big community of the, those young people that are into Bowman Chrome and into prospecting. There's folks my age, your age, and then there's folks even older doing it. So I and, and I'll tell you something. At being at the Home Run Derby as well, Adley Rush Roshman. I I remember get I had his I've had him I've held him before. The catcher thing always throws you off as a Bowman Chrome guy. You're always like, oh, a catcher. You know what what's that really going to mean? Long term. But that man, I mean, you see him live and in person. I don't know if you've seen him play in per- that. He is incredible. The way he hits the ball, that guy's a monster. He's a monster. I think he's like another Mike Piazza, in my opinion. I think that, I mean, I know Hall of Fame doesn't always mean your cards are going to be okay long term, especially with his price point. But I think Roshman's pretty special. And I want to ask you now, because I got two more questions. This is one of those two. In your opinion, who's the best young baseball player in baseball? Who who's your favorite? Who's the guy you think is going to just really go? Well, first of all, with Adley Rushman, I am I am selling one of his cards, a blue refractor Bowman Chrome autograph. I'm holding one as well. I do like him. He was I made a one of the last episodes I made um, that wasn't a uh, you know subscription box type thing was talking about one uh, my four picks for at least the first half of 2023, mm-hmm. and Adley was in there, and um, I know. Brent Ware, the deep value guy, has been on your channel, hmm. and he's uh, he's talked about like is he's overvalued relative to Buster Posey because he's selling for about the same, but he hasn't, and he probably won't amount to nearly as much. The way I perceive Adley's valuations are, I think it's fine. I think he's come down quite a bit. I think I look at hype and psychology in that he still has potential, and I think if he starts to show which he hasn't yet, mm-hmm. the power, the 10 war potential that Posey had. And I know, you know, the World Series rings like, pff, who knows? But in baseball, I'm not too worried about that. Yeah. But it's more about like, can you play at that level? If you're a top five most impactful player in the sport, like Posey probably was during his dominance, then your prices are going to reflect that. Forget about the player comp. And people are going to be looking at that, the body of work that hasn't been filled out yet, that potential, that potential is very powerful in people's eyes. Correct. But he's got to show performance, right? He's got to show a glimpse of a glimmer of Posey like production. He's not there yet. Um, and if he did, I think he could be priced higher than Posey. Um, what have you done for me lately? Right? Like yeah. people are looking at selling to a greater fool. And how are you going to get a greater fool to buy Posey? Right. Right. I just, man, can you stop it? And what, what, out. what his career could amount to Time out. that you just get, you just coined. I don't know how many times have you said that out loud selling to a greater fool. Have you said that before on any, any of your shows? I haven't heard you say that before. No, that is, that is, that is awesome. Like let's like clip that. If we can do this, Dustin's an hour into this with us editing this clip that selling to a greater fool. There's just something really powerful about, about that that phrase when it comes to the hobby. Selling to a greatest when it comes to prospecting, investing, doesn't it to you? Selling to a greater fool. What's that mean to you when you say that though? Like I'm not saying you that's that's your mantra. Sh- just- Short term sort of speculation. There's somebody that's willing to buy this card within the next five years. I think that if Adley's who I think he is, I think within the next five years. He's more likely to eclipse Posey prices or by 30% because I know he's already close. Maybe he's a little bit above him than to fall below by 30%. In the long term, yes, Posey will probably win. But I'm not holding Adley forever. And he's got his whole career ahead of him. He did debut a little bit older. So I looked into the player, like the comparisons. Um, I think Adley projected to have a little more offense, a little less defense. But right now it looks like. So coming into that all-star game, he had like a 417 slugging percentage. I'm like, why the hell is he in the home run derby? He's like all singles or walks at this point. So he's going to need to show that power. You've got Francisco Alvarez right now is kind of overshadowing him. He's got like close to the same war and like half the plate appearances. So Adley's going to need to show up. But if he is who we think he is, um, then I think prices could be more expensive than today. And that's factoring in Posey's, you know, where he's at and him being undervalued. And I think you can get burned by looking at comparing two players that are kind of similar um, because the situations are different. You could have looked at Corbin Carroll, compared him to uh, 
Trey Turner and been like, well, you know, his upside's probably Trey Turner and uh, his hobby sucks. So why would Corbin? Well, they're different players, different walk rate. You know, Turner missed a bunch of his prime because of injury. Uh, so he missed a little bit of his peak there too. Um, bounced around a number of teams. They're different. And, and if you paid attention to that, then you wouldn't have bought Corbin Carroll either. Um, but, and that wouldn't have worked. So anyways, um, Ellie De La Cruz, uh, who I don't own anything of, I do have some of the wax, mm-hmm. but um, he'd be the most, the player I'm impressed with most. And he kind of is the closest thing to Tatis since Tatis. And he doesn't have the three issues of injury risk, being stupid, doing stupid things. And, uh, <laughs> and, and number three is a steroid thing. So he doesn't have those three things. He's actually striking out 30% of the time, which I think is awesome based on his minor league numbers. Like usually you strike out more in the majors. Like he's sort of at his minor league levels. Um, Batting average, it looks legit in my opinion, because he had like pretty strong, what they call batting average balls in play in minors. If you probably understand what that is. And he's got speed. He's hitting the ball a little bit too much in the ground right now, but I don't think 150 plate appearances is enough to worry. I don't know if that's stabilized and all he has to do is knock that down from like 55% to 45% and it'll be like Tatis quality of contacts like Tatis. I'm paying attention to the walk rate right now. It's around 5%. I don't like that. That's like Boba levels. That's like killing Boba hobby, to be honest, um, that in the defense of Bichette. I'm looking in, I'm looking at Ellie's, um, uh, his, his defense too, playing shortstop. That's going to give you a little bit of a bump on war. Um, but if he plays above average defense at the shortstop position, that's, really good that's like the holy grail that's what you want so i'm probably most impressed with him and i think the power surge is going to come i know he's only got a few home runs so far um but if that doesn't turn around if the ground ball rate sticks and the power doesn't come this year then he goes from being a little overvalued to a lot overvalued and his prices will come down probably in the off season and it'll be cheaper to buy even in february we'll, so we'll see so okay so ellie's your guy right now but I might not buy him, but yeah, he, he's like him. the most exciting player. Yeah, he's the most exciting young player. How do you feel about Acuna, Tati, Soto? I mean, these big guys that were like, you know, for the last four or five years have been everybody's been really high on. Yeah, so Acuna, you know, I, I sold a big card of his last year, and um, with me, like. It's sort of like what Luis Roberts dealing with now. Like, even though he's having a great season, like he's, he's there's so much resistance because there's so many people that are were just waiting, right? Waiting for a hot streak with Acuna. Like, just stay healthy for a year and like win one MVP, um, so we can all just sell and get out of your cards. So you're seeing that supply come up and kind of hold his prices down, and he's kind of flat. But relative to the rest of the market, he's up. So you got to pay attention to that too. Like relative to some of the other guys that are doing okay and their prices are tumbling, Juan Franco over the last few months. You know, that that's that's almost a win with Acuna. But if Acuna keeps on doing what he's doing, if he does sort of like Otani, like year one, like, oh, shit, like people went crazy, right? Year two, it's like, uh, well, he does have a lot of rookie cards. There's not a clear hierarchy. Uh, I don't know. Like, uh, maybe maybe he can't really, maybe there's not really much room for prices to go more. But if they keep on doing it, then that, like, resistance gets, like, broken. And then they right. reach newer levels. So with Luis Robert... <laughs> It's going to take him even longer to become relevant again with Acuna. He's got to show us uh, probably another, like, I don't know, win the MVP, put up a, you know, I mean, the numbers are going to be crazy, right? Like 50 steals, 35 home runs, something like that, 300 average right now. I think his expected stats are actually even better. Um, But um, Acuna will get his love. He just got to show it for a little bit longer, given that I think there was a lot of scared money in his stuff. And with Luis Robert, like, He's never stayed healthy and been productive for full season. So you really can't blame people. Another guy with a ton of rookie guards, too. He hurt himself in the home run derby. You know, I mean, he hurt himself in the home run derby. Like that Luis Robert got hurt in the home run derby. I I couldn't, yeah, you can't. I don't I could not invest in Luis Robert. I've I've had his card before. I just you can't. I thankfully I got out. But um Soto and Soto to tease. Talk about Soto and to tease. Yeah, Soto. You know, I PC the guy I said earlier. Kind of um, the issue with him is like when he turns it on for three to four months out of the year, I'm constantly thinking like, when is it all going to shut off again? Because he's just really fortunate that the WAR equation loves walks. 
because there's very few guys that can do what he does and still put up a six to six and a half, seven war. People deem it like a super excellent season, right? Um, if, if you put up that war and he does it, and you look at like the surface numbers and you're like, how did he do it? Well, because war loves the 20% walk rate. So even though he doesn't contribute with his legs, the power has been under 30 home runs a year for every season, but one, the batting average hasn't been there lately. The defense isn't there. That's terrible for him. He's able to still put up the appearance of like a really great season. And he is, he's a really great, like, you know, player, but like, this isn't who I signed up for the people that own Soto. We, we don't want this. We want like elite of elite. And the issue is now Otani is making it more clear with every game mm -hmm. that there's Otani and then there's everybody else. Correct. Goodbye right now. I think his prices will continue to slide through at least November, December. I think there's just too many distractions. I don't think there's a possibility for stuff to really snap back in a meaningful way. Um, so like, do I sell now and buy back for like a 10% discount if that happens in like December or like, no, fees will eat that up. So like I'm selling some stuff that I don't care as much about. Um, and I'm a little worried long-term because like the hit tool was supposed to be legit and like, what's he doing? You can blame it on a lot of different things. And San Diego, um, he's the type of hitter where the stadium shouldn't hold him down that much. Like I know like park factors, like it's been one of the worst. I know the, the team's bad, you know, no hitting coach, no support, too many prima donnas, like whatever. Like, but people use the context excuse for him in Washington. Like, oh, he just needs a better team. Like, oh, San Diego is going to be great. Like if Soto gets signed by the Yankees, will that help him? Like maybe his hobby a little bit because of the market bump, but like yeah. the, the short porch and right, he already can hit the ball to the pull side, like 450 feet. Is that really going to help him? Or is that going to make him pull the ball more? Which the shift limitations were already giving him that incentive, which was not the best Soto. We wanted Soto to take the ball the opposite way, especially with breaking balls. That's when he's at his best. Uh, he's just a complicated guy. So, and, and with Tatis, there's just a ceiling on his stuff that's shown. Like he's, if you do fantasy baseball leagues, he's like a top three dynasty guy right now. Like he's back. And like people aren't worried about the injuries right now. But like the steroid stuff, um, you can tell that's like people aren't like buying Tatis long term. Yeah, and yeah. you don't have that market. Like, yeah, like you, you don't have that upside. You don't have that 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 same ceiling as like somebody like Otani, or even Soto still has, um, or or Tatis more expensive than him. I don't know. Well, speaking of a market, and and this is I compare this. This is, this is all. We'll finish with this this question. Um, since I compare Trout's collecting collector market, collector base, feels like a Ken Griffey Jr. collector base 10 years from now. You've got a generation of people that that's their Griffey. He's definitely not as transcendent. He's very quiet and reserved. And, you know, there's, but there's really nothing like hovering around him. There, there was talk of the, the, you know, thyroid condition. He's, is he taking something? Do we know that for sure that that got quickly sh hushed up? But other than that, there's really no speculation on anything nefarious going on and, and unlike, unlike Tatis. But is he done? I mean, is there an opportunity, in your opinion, is there an opportunity if you're a trout guy or you want to get back in trout? And again, we're not making picks here on this show. We're, this collector series is literally turned into a, a baseball show, which to me, I love because this is like, this is like, I'm, I'm a pig in, you know, what right now. But is trout. Atani is clearly the guy on the team now. And I think he's been the guy on the team for two years now, maybe even longer. I mean, at least two years now. But Trout's been hurt a lot. Is Trout done? Is there, an, is there going to be an opportunity to buy into Trout? I'm not really worried about him long term in a sense. I don't know. Are you with that collector base that he has? I feel like it's a pretty, you know, I use that lake analogy. I feel like that's still a pretty big lake and it's pretty deep. Do you feel like long term Trout's going to be okay? But is he really going to get to some of these numbers we need him to get to to be the guy we think and wanted him to be? And is he done having a productive – I mean, is he, is he done being productive? And, and, and where is there going to be an entry point for his cards? Are they going to dip even further where maybe some of us can get into some of those for, for the long term? Yeah, I think long term he's, he's got a safe place in the hobby from that regard. Um, he's clearly the generational guy of the 2010s. He played at a peak performance – <laughs> so trout i'm worried about not his hobby long term but i'm worried about the the bumps in the road from now until then because of 
my worry about his performance. Mm -hmm. I mean, the rare back issue. And by the way, I do have a, a pretty big Soto uh, trout card. <clears throat> and at one point I would have considered myself like, oh yeah, I PC trout. I've slowly gotten rid of some of the, some of the cards there. I still got a uh, pretty big one, but I, I am a little bit worried, a lot worried. You, you see players that kind of struggle to maintain like hobby importance and prices of yep. their cards, like throughout like the, the twilight years of their career. Um, like, We'll see it on a, on a smaller level with Francisco Lindor. I think we already have um, a little bit different because, you know, he's probably not going to have the same legacy or even get to the Hall of Fame at this point. Looks questionable at best. But, you know, like an Arenado, a Machado, I, I, I imagine that they struggle when their performance falls off or even just, you know, five years before their expected retirement date. So you've got that. And with Trout, it's been like just he's crashed a bit this year. Um, I mean, it was, it was him staying on the field for like the last few years until this year, where his performance, like weighted OBA, like you look at some of the numbers there, like it just wasn't the, the normal trout. So then you start to worry about the back and that affecting him. I mean, it's, it's a long-term issue, right? It's one that's right. going to plague him for his whole career. So on top of that, you've got all these other little things that come up, like what just happened and knocked him out for the whole year, the rest of the right. year. Right. So, yeah, I'm a little worried, you know. I guess you can compare him to Griffey in the sense that... Um, he just got hurt in his, in his back half, man. That's all yeah, sure. that, that's that and also, also the, the timing of the of their debut and of their dominance versus, like, a golden era of collecting, in a way. Griffey timed it a little bit better. Uh, with Trout, you know, I guess his peak seemed to end around, like, what, 2017, 2018? 2019, he won an MVP. 2019. 2019. Um, so a lot of collectors, you know, in there versus like maybe a pool Sinitro, which wouldn't have as many like Facebook groups. Like I'm, I kind of believe in that a bit. And I think that could, I, yeah, that yeah. I think that might actually hurt Brady a little bit. It's helped that he stayed very, um, competitive and like before he retired for the most part and, uh, in football, not as a sport, but as like, a, you know, as like, I feel like football card collectability really ramped up over the last five to six years. And that's going to help Brady. The fact that more collectors, non Patriots fans were able to kind of get in, uh, but um, have that attachment. So yeah, I guess, I guess there could be a Griffey comp there. And um, I mean, we'll see what the next few years have in store, but I kind of wish like, sometimes you wish like maybe if they're, if they just retired now, <laughs> you would be better. Don't, yeah, you don't then, see the rest of it. Yeah, you don't yeah. See then, the then, then, then you'd fall back on so like uh, OPS plus, like all these stats that are going to get absolutely hammered from like the the second half of his career, or like average WAR per season. You know, it, it's he's already got the numbers that get him into the hall um, first ballot, <laughs> unless it gets taken away from his next view. I, I'd still think he'd be first ballot, but you look at like yeah. milestones that. Oh, he played in you know eighteen year season, and he still didn't making it up. But he still didn't get to five hundred home runs or whatever. Like eh, having to worry about that, and like the, the pools comparisons, and who's another great player. But mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, he he's safe, but he's not super attractive right now. And I bet he like how would he not get cheaper from yeah. from over the next two to three years. That's assuming he's on the field for like 120 games a season. Like like a lot of people looked at the the lack of postseason success. I always laughed at those people. I'm like, well, the fact that you can't recognize that means that he's probably undervalued if enough people think that. Sure enough, he was undervalued. Well, till he wasn't anymore, right? <laughs> till a couple right. of years ago. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. I, we, we've been looking at, you know, we, we've just got your voice here for the last little question there, but we've, we obviously had a lot of content. So those of you who hang out to the very end of this episode, it is a little, a little wonky here at the end, but you know, have no fear. You just, we just got about an hour and 10 minutes um, uninterrupted Filmington giving us a clinic on baseball, on wax, baseball card, collecting tops, products, print runs, parallels, his origin story, his journey, where he's going, what he's trying to do. Um, you said you had a big trout card. What's that card? I, I, I'm supposed to ask your top 10 cards, but let me just ask, what's your best card? What's the number one card you own? You're like, you know what? I'm, I'm amazed I even own this thing. It's the last one I'd sell. Well, 
It's the, uh, it, it used to be a big card. Now it's a medium card, <laughs> to you at least. Uh, <laughs> Bowman Chrome Autograph Refractor, so number to 500 uh, to PSA 9. I had a PSA 10 and I sold it. Didn't time the peak perfectly, but I did really well on that. So that makes me feel better that I at least sold a 10 when I bought the 9 a few months later. Um, so that's that's the one big card. Um, the, the The only one that's probably worth talking about. No, it's a trout. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha, oh, I gotcha. thought you asked. I thought, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. But, you, uh, yeah. So you didn't, you didn't okay, mention the name. Okay. So, so, so it was the, a trout refractor. Got it. Auto yeah. Baseball. I mean, the, bi the biggest cards are, um, at this point, it's Pokemon. <laughs> Two nice. Pokemon. Hey, no, that's nothing wrong with that, man. I mean, Charizard, I mean, PSA 9, first edition, base set English, and then the uh, Venus Horror, PSA 10, base set English. Um, I don't know. Just uh, haven't really felt the need to sell those ones yet. Trying to sell other stuff instead. There could be a, uh, I don't know, a rotation, kind of like what we saw. What do we, when do we see vintage really like pick up for like baseball? Was that like the second half of 2021 or something? Second or? half of 2021 going into 22. It was kind of hip then. Like people were trying to, yeah, people are trying to get cute with that, how they strategized with all the, you know, everything coming down, right? Yes. Yeah, people, people that are smarter are trying to diversify or, um, I don't know, trying to take a little risk off the table. Like maybe you see that. I feel like we saw we've seen a big Pokemon modern run, but we haven't seen that really affect vintage yet. And it's the same characters. It's not like, well, I don't know who Jim Brown is. No, it's like literally Charizard. He's like still the best character. So I don't know. There could be something there, but yeah. Who knows, man? Just all speculation. I'm not a financial advisor. I don't provide financial advice. And there is your disclaimer. Thank you so much, Phil Mixon, for jumping on uh the show this has been a long time coming I've, I've wanted to get you on here from like day one it took till now but i'm really happy i, I just never i just i hadn't asked you yet but uh i saw you comment on a video and i was like oh my gosh i got phil Meeson listening holy cow gotta gotta wrap this guy in because i got we gotta talk about baseball we gotta talk about racks we gotta talk about bowman chrome we gotta talk about tops chrome your rookie explosion box the stuff you're doing the things you've done um the conversation before was almost as good if not better than the conversation we just had now um not teasing anybody there but that was really cool thanks for um indulging me there but uh hey you're going to national we're going to run this thing on saturday which is uh two days from now the 22nd of july so uh people are going to be able to have this pre-national and i you know i'm sure everybody's looking forward to seeing you and um i'll be there next year um very look much, very much looking forward to that and connecting with you guys even more throughout the year so i can even have a more um exciting experience going there next year but thanks for jumping on, man, and taking time. Even though I've been talking to a black screen for a little minute here, it's still been great. This has been a great show, and it's been a clinic. Hopefully, everybody gets uh, a lot from it. Comment below. I know Phil's going to jump in there and respond. Um, you have questions, uh, concerns. Uh, you want to debate him. You know, he's he's not shy about that. I know he comments on his videos and his comment section often. Um, it's very he's very engaged in that. So you know, fire away um, and let us know what you think. Anyway, thanks for jumping on, Phil. You have a great night. And everybody out there, take care. Um, subscribe to uh, the Sports Card Dad channel. You follow me at DPZ, at PC with DPZ. You can follow Phil Filmington. Where, where do you follow you at, bud? Yeah, the main places are going to be YouTube and Instagram. I've also got an uh, eBay handle. They're all the same. Filmington. Got it. Filmington. All right, everybody. Take care. I know that Phil's doing like a, a salute right now. You know, you can't see him. Uh, <laughs> have a great rest of your night, and we'll talk to you later. Take care, guys. Thank you.